Guys, welcome to another Sales Wisdom Podcast. A legend is there with us today. His name is John Barrows. He is CEO at JB Sales. John, can you introduce yourself and tell us a bit more about JB Sales? Yeah, thanks, Charles. Uh, John Barrows, CEO of Sell Better. I'm sorry, by JB Sales. And uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've been in sales for what, uh, 27 years now, uh, trying to do what I can to stay above water uh, with everything that's changing. I mean, I've uh, I started with my degree in marketing, but then got into sales with DeWalt, then Xerox, and then started a company doing outsourced IT services. And that's where I kind of started to learn uh, all the different sales methodologies, if you will. And uh, after I sold that company to Staples, joined one of the sales training companies, and then they screwed it up and I took it over. So for the past, past 15 years, I've been off on my own doing sales training for companies like Salesforce, LinkedIn, Box, Dropbox, a lot of the SaaS and the tech companies in the world and and uh, trying to sell my way through it just like everybody else. Love it. As an intro, I would love to talk about what's in your background. I guess this is what matters to you. Tell us about what's in there and why uh, it has a place in your most important background. Uh, yeah, so uh, there's a lot of stuff. I mean, it's actually funny, you know, I, with the, with the all, everything being remote now, you know, one of the things we have to think about is a lot of times we used to be able to go into a client's office and, and kind of look around and develop rapport based on what we saw. But now with everybody with a virtual background, it's really hard to do that. So what I coach reps on is small thing, but look in your background, right? That people can relate to stuff in your background to try to create connections. And so I put a lot of stuff, a lot of family things, obviously my wife and daughter are probably not probably are the most important thing for me. That book right there is a book that I wrote with my daughter. Uh, it's called, I want to be in sales when I grow up. And that was my you know, a, my attempt to connect with her a little bit, but also try to elevate the profession at a, at a root level. Uh, I have some boxing gloves back there, which is about, you know, just making sure that you fight. Uh, then there's the sports stuff with Teddy Bruschi, who is a New England Patriot here in uh, American football. Uh, he was one of my favorite players because he never had an agent. He negotiated everything himself and he was just the heart and soul of the team. Uh, that football there is recorded is uh, autographed by every member of the 2016 Patriots, which is great. And Tom wow. Brady, uh, Pete Rose autographed baseball, who I met, uh, Michael Jordan on the basketball. Uh, cool thing here with Wade Boggs on the beer can, and then a Gary V uh, gratitude grape ape or whatever it is uh, uh, trading card there, and then some art up there, and my daughter's picture there. So, Love bunch it. of different things. Hey, that gives me a lot of segue. First, I want to be in sales when I grow up. Like, did you force that on her? And why would you recommend people to start in sales? <laughs> uh, no, I didn't force it. I don't force anything on my daughter. It, uh, it was more of a, an attempt. Everybody had asked me, John, when do you, you know, when are you going to write a book? And, you know, for me, I, I haven't read, I don't read a lot of books. So I feel like I'd be a little bit of a hypocrite if I wrote a book. Uh, plus, you know, what am I going to write if uh, that hasn't already been written in sales? That said, you know, my daughter is 12 years old and for the majority of her life, I was traveling all over the world. This was before COVID. And so I was kind of a weekend dad. And for your kid, when you tell your kid you're a lawyer, a doctor, police officer, they understand what that is because they can see it on TV. But when you tell your kid you're in sales, they have a hard time kind of wrapping their head around what that is. And so in an attempt to connect with my daughter a little bit, um, this was her journey into girl, selling Girl Scout cookies. So she had come to me one year and said, you know, when she was six and she said, daddy, you know, I have this link here and I'm selling Girl Scout cookies. Could you share it on your social profile? Cause I know you have a big social profile. And I was like, no, uh, <laughs> she's like, well, not, I was like, well, that first of all, that's my network. And I work my ass off to get it. And second of all, why would they buy from you over anybody else? And she's like, well, what do I need to do? And I was like, oh, you got to give your pitch. So we practiced a little pitch and we did a recording of it. And, uh, and then I wrote a, then I wrote a blog about it. Right. And then the next year we went door to door, right? So it was door to door selling. And so we practiced objection handling. So I did another video and then we did a, a blog post about that. And then what that did was that kind of evolved into us writing the book. And uh, it was a great way just to connect with her. But also, you know, the, the goal is to elevate the profession at the root level because no kid ever says that no kid ever says, I want to be in sales when I grow up. And I think, that's a shame because when sales is when sales is done right, I think it's one of the greatest professions in the world. When done right. wrong, I think it's one of the worst. And when you ask about why, you know, I would encourage people to get into sales is because it's look, it can be one of the most fulfilling um, and rewarding careers ever if you do it right. I mean, sales is about helping people solve problems and achieve goals. That's really ultimately what it is. And, you know, yeah, the financial component is a benefit to it if you do this right. But 
if your main goal is making money and you don't care what you're selling, then you're the one who gives sales professionals a bad name, right? You're out there just, just, you don't care about the client's needs. You just care about your commission check. And you're the jerk out there that I really wish would get out of this profession. But if you're in it for the right reasons to, to make a difference, um, sales can, is the, one of the most flexible jobs there is out there. It's also, I don't want to say recession proof, but it is one of those professions where in a down economy, people got to sell in an up economy, people want to sell, um, with artificial intelligence coming out right now. I mean, so many industries are being disrupted at every level. And so if you went to be a coder, for instance, like say you went to school to, to be in coding, I'd be very worried right now if I was encoding because, you know, AI is coming real damn fast for that. Unless you're one of the top coders out there that that can tell the machines what to do, you're probably going to get replaced. Or not just sales. If you get, if you're in an industry that gets massively disrupted about, you know, artificial for artificial intelligence, well, then you just go find a different industry that you can sell into. So you right. can be, it's, it's more flexible. It's, it's most sales professionals get paid far more than the executives do. If you do, if so, be the highest grossing, you know, more than doctors and everybody else. So that's right. why I think most people should uh, at least consider it. So do you think sales is going to be one of the last uh, profession to be pushed away by AI? No, I actually, I think AI is coming for sales quite, you know, quite rapidly as a matter of fact. And I think a lot of sales professionals are going through the motions. I think they are, um, you know, we've unfortunately over-engineered the sales process over the past 10 years and tried to solve it with technology and people. And we forgot the fundamentals. And so now all these sales reps are, are now that the economy is tough, they're, they're having a hard time selling through it because they don't have fundamentals to fall back on. And, you know, we've, tr we've turned them into robots. I mean, it's kind of like everybody complains about the trophy generation, right? These kids who are, everybody wants a trophy. Well, those kids didn't ask for the trophies, right? I mean, they, they, I mean, when I was growing up, if I didn't come in first, second or third, I felt bad. I, I felt bad that I didn't win, but my parents said, well, go figure out how to get better. Right. Um, whereas now the kid loses and still feels bad, but now the parent gives them the trophy because they don't want to. And it's the same thing with sales reps. It's we've given these reps technology. We forced it down their throat. And especially in the SaaS world, you know, the tech world, it's one of those ones where, you know, we've butts and seats, you know what I mean? We've just thrown money out the, at the problem. Right. And if you were 60% of quota, that's okay because 60% is better than 0% of somebody in that seat because we're growing right. so fast. Right. And so that's why I think a lot of them are in trouble and all this AI that is, especially on the front end of messaging and connections and cadences and all that stuff, that stuff is being oh, like rapidly taken over by AI. So if you're not a full cycle sales, if you can't carry conversation and add value throughout a conversation and that type of thing, you're getting replaced right now. Right. I also think coming back to your 60% uh, performance point, uh, sales is so hard. Um, when I started making 200 phone calls a day, that was a decade ago, I really had to change my soul in the process. Uh, I had this accent. I was calling and I still have an accent. I was calling these engineers and these architects in Canada, and I was really hard. And I, I think that's that's why we tend to tolerate the 60% because we know it, it's kind of hard. How do you get over that initial step of massive technical and EQ change when you start in sales? It's tough. I mean, that's why I think it, you know, most sales reps are in and out in less than a year or two because they can't handle it. Right. Cause it is, it is not very rewarding. I mean, you have to, you know, in, in, in here in the States, right. The baseball, if, if you're, if you're batting 300 in baseball, then you're doing a great job. You're going, you're probably going to go to the hall of fame right. um, in sales. If you're batting 1%, 2%, right especially when it comes to prospecting, you're, you're doing great. And, and right. so I think it's a lot of it has to do with, you know, your grit, if you will, of being able to handle that, but also realizing that if you look, if you treat everything as an experiment right now, you know, I tell, I said, I tell sales reps all the time, like if you, if I, if, if I had to go back and tell my 22 year old self something, right, what would it be? And it would be to a, B split test, everything. So treat sales more of a science than an art. You'll figure right. out the art along the way, but the science is test something, right? So say you're calling into CIOs in healthcare. Well, come up with two different messages to CIOs in healthcare and make 20 phone calls with this approach and 20 phone calls of that approach and see which one yields a higher response rate. Because 
if I tell you to make 50 dials in a day and you make 50 dials and you get no meetings, that is a brutal day. That is one of those days where you just look at yourself. Why am I in this profession? What am I doing here? But if I tell you make 50 dials and, and instead of just making 50 blind cold calls with a generic elevator pitch, you do 25 and 25. So you do $25 with this approach and $25 with this approach to the same persona. And say you do that and you still get no meetings. To me, that's actually not a bad day because you just figured out two approaches that don't work. And you could do this across the board. You could do this with even forget about the full cold call. How about the how you introduce yourself? So literally how you say hello dictates where the conversation goes. So 20 times you say it this way, objection handling, write down an objection that you're getting smoked on. Google, what's the best way of handling that objection? Come up with two different approaches. Next 10 times it comes up, deal with it this way. Next 10 times deal with it that way. By doing that, because if you can say you learned something at the end of the day, you'll get through it. And you'll and you'll thrive because of it. But if you're just going through the motions, hitting the numbers, you're going to get out of this profession pretty damn fast. Dude, this is such great advice. And I understood. I just had a flash as per why I struggled so much uh, when I um, started my sales career. I didn't have this scientific mindset, this A-B testing mindset, which I very much have nowadays. I'm, I'm known as uh, the product market fit mad uh, scientist in my industry. Um, <laughs> although you probably don't know me, everything considered equal. Um and I, I guess this is because of the current education system that when you do a test, you know, an exam, there's no test. There's there no there's no A-B testing. You fail, you fail. You yep. win, you win. And that that's why I was left with this mindset at probably 18 or 19. And every time I, I used to have a phone call that was negative or someone dissing me on the phone, uh, it was a net loss uh, in my mind. And that really like crushed my soul and really like remove all the motivation I had in me. So very good um, advice and everything considered equal. You're one of the guys that gives like the, the best sales advice um, that I see on LinkedIn, uh, uh, your content and so forth. How do you stay humble and in all of that? How, how do you keep your EQ in check while your sales IQ is really high? I think sales is an easy thing to keep you humble, man. I mean, like I said, you know, I, like, I'll give you an example. Uh, you know, back in January and February, the bottom fell out of the industry, especially the tech and the SaaS industry. And so for me, I've always sold, right? But I've like going back to like hardcore selling, right? Really making calls and that type of thing I haven't done for a while. So I got back on my horse, right? I in January, I, I made a ton of phone calls, hit LinkedIn and everything else. And I generated 49 sales meetings in, in February. Nice. Uh, and I think 70, 70 in Q1. And like, okay, great. But going on those meetings, you know, it's not like I made it rain. It's not like I closed 75% of them. I got told no, just like the rest of everybody, you know, and, and even quote unquote me with John Barrows with my brand and what I do and all the stuff that I've built over the years, I still get people to ghost me. I still get people to tell me, I still miss my forecast. I still, you know, every day. And so I think if you're actively selling every day, it's very easy to stay humble. Uh, if you're one of those sales trainers that um, do as I say, not as I do, and has built a larger organization and you can kind of just coast at this point, well then, yeah, um, it's hard to stay humble because you can pretend like your brand is great and everybody buys because of it. But uh, I think if you're an active seller, it's it's hard not to be humble. Let's put it that way. <laughs> right. Same on my side. Well, I mean, I don't do cold calls anymore. I had my call centers and that was one of my biggest failures. And that was like five years ago already. Mm -hmm. But I still send um, probably 3,000-ish um, cold emails on a daily basis. I mean, most of them are uh, semi-personalized, but I get to create at least five to 10 new campaigns per day, experiments, I call them, right? Yep. Um, so yeah, I kind of bake my own cookies. Um, so nice to nice to hear that. Um, I've heard you mention multiple times um, sports analogy. How <laughs> does watching or practicing sports help you improve your sales skills and your CEO skills? know about why you know look i think watching sports sports is a lot about teamwork and a lot about watching uh, you know <laughs> a great stat i'll give you an example you know everybody all millennials think that lebron james is the greatest basketball player of all time and i'm going to call bullshit and i will never ever 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 think that lebron james is the greatest basketball player of all time michael jordan is by far lebron james Beast. doesn't even hold it close and, and the reason is and there's plenty of stats to show it but the reason is the one that highlighted me recently on I saw it on Instagram was when Michael Jordan was playing basketball, if you looked at every single one of his teammates, 
if you compared when he played with them versus when he didn't. So when Michael Jordan was not on the game, was not in the game, every single person he played for increased their points per game, yeah, increased depends. their, right? So even though Jordan, the scoring champion and everything else, when he played with people, their stats got better. Right. On the flip side, LeBron James, every time LeBron James played with somebody, their stats went down. Oh, that's sad. And so if you look at, you know, you you can some, sometimes look at these, these all-stars and be like, holy shit, look at how great that person is. And look, if you want to be an individual contributor your entire life, okay, yeah, you can, you, I, you can get by that way. But if you want to enjoy yourself, you want to be on a team, you want to learn from other people, you got to make other people around you better. And right. I, I'm a big player, you know, I'm a big team sport guy. Um, I don't care about individual statistics. I care about, do we win? Ultimately, are we winning? And, you know, the thing that I like and don't like about, about sports is I you know, there's the finite game and the infinite game. The finite game is you are playing to win the game, right? So there's a beginning and an end, there's an enemy and you try to win. Whereas the infinite game is something you just try to stay in the game. And I'm a big Simon Sinek fan where I don't really look at competition. I, I don't really care about my competition. I'm just trying to stay in the game here. And so that's why right. I've never been like overly obsessed with my competition. And so I think you can pull a lot from sports, but you also don't want to get too locked in to say, okay, like, yeah, like let's win and we're uh, that type of thing. I think that's a rather toxic environment. In some cases that doesn't really flow too well in this world, because also one other thing about this is there's, you know, especially in sales, there is a very bro culture in sales and a lot of it is sports oriented and it really, really pushes women and people who are not, you know, white males who are all fucking, yeah, let's hit it. You know what I mean? It really just, it really pushes them out of the profession. And so I think there's a little bit of a danger. I think it's a bit of an old school mentality, by the way, for leaders to say, oh, I only want to hire athletes. I think that's a very old school mentality, even though there's definitely components of athletes that are very beneficial. It's to have that singular mentality of that's all I'm going to hire. I think that's a fool's errand. Right. And what type of sports did they play? Was it individual sports? Was it team sports? Um, in a hockey analogy, classic Canadian meme, that would mm -hmm. be kind of cross BVS Ovechkin debate. Um, yep. You made various good points here. Yes, the the bro uh, culture, I guess we see it even uh, in me and sometimes you. Uh, I'm not sure about you, but like sometimes we, we compare or work um, with some others, you know, we flag other cold emails just for content. So I think it's it's kind of limited, but I very much believe in competition, which is cooperation and competition together. Yep. You need the drive, but you also need to cooperate. You have 400K followers on your LinkedIn. You accepted to be on my podcast today. So very grateful for that. Uh, and that segues pretty nicely into our next topic, which is happiness and gratefulness, mm -hmm. uh, respectively on your right and left side. How does that play a role in sales uh, when you're like all down and uh, uh, poopy pants, uh, sad face, you know, then you, you've had yeah. like 50 no's, like how, how does that play? How does that revive you? Yeah, I mean, I'll talk about, you know, happiness, uh, you know, happiness is, is the ultimate goal for everybody, right? Success is a relative term. Um, you know, I'm kind of a Gary, v, I'm a Gary, v, v, Gary Vaynerchuk fan, and he says, you know, if you make, you know, $45,000 a year and you're happy, you win, right? Like, because right. I know millionaires who are, who are just miserable people. And so to me, what does happiness look like for you? And I think that's where a lot of times we have to get ourselves out of the mentality of doing what we're supposed to do or doing what society tells us to do. Oh, we got to get a job. We got to get married. We got to have a house. We got to have some, you know, like that, that is a, okay. And some people are very happy and following through that path, but a lot of people aren't. And so I think it, you know, I really encourage people to figure out, you know, your why let's go back to Simon Sinek. Like, why do you do what you do? What makes you happy? Right. What's your def your definition of happiness. And then if you know that, well, then you can architect your life and your job and your career and whatever around achieving that. And that's where, if you don't have a plan, if you don't have a goals and those type of things, then you tend to just keep going around trying to find less shitty situations, you know what I mean? And, and bouncing from one to the next. But if you have a plan and you're like, this is where I want to go, this is what's going to make me happy. This is how I'm going to get there. And you don't ignore the journey either. I think that's the other part of this is like, if you're, if you're just looking at the end goal, I think you're, you're going to be, you're going to struggle with happiness because all of us, we always reach that plateau and it's never 
as satisfying as we want it to be. Cause then, you know, for, especially for those of us who are driven, like we want that next thing and that next thing and that next thing. And they're like, if you look for that, that thing, it's never going to drive happiness. So you have to enjoy the path, but that's why you have to know why you do what you do. So that's happiness. Gratitude is something that I think I, I believe in wholeheartedly. You know, if you, if you do affirmations, if you do any of that stuff, it's just, you know, I sit down, I have a gratitude journal where at the end of the day, I write down three or four things that I'm that I'm grateful for. And no matter how small they might be, you know, I'll give you an example. Somebody, I had a friend come to me one time and they were in really, really bad shape and they, you know, and everything was negative for them. Everything was negative. And I said to him, I said, do me a favor, grab this notebook. And I want you to write down every single positive thing that happens to you tomorrow. And I don't care how small it is, by the way, if somebody opens the door for you, if you get a text message from somebody you haven't heard from in a while, get a green light on your way to work, just write it down, just see what happens, right? And at the end of the day, she came to me with, you know, four pages of notes. And she was like, oh my God, I had the best day ever. Like, oh my God, this was so great. And I asked her, I was like, do you think today was really any different than any other day? Or do you think you just started looking for the positive as opposed to looking for the negative? And I think that's where, you know, it changed your mindset. So for me, gratitude is, you know, we're, we all get caught in this world of, of like, oh, you know, worries me and blah, blah, blah. But if you really take a step back, I mean, <laughs> there's a lot to be grateful for. I mean, if you're if you are healthy, if your family is not sick, if you have a roof over your head, like let's start there, right? I mean, there's I think I forget what the stat is, but there is a large portion of this population in the world that doesn't have access to running water. You know what I mean? And so, who are you to sit there and because your Uber was late or because your fucking Starbucks order was wrong, you know that means you're having a bad day? Eh, I think you better take a step back and figure out what you should be actually grateful for. And it's, it's important to, to be grateful, gracious and grateful, but also be willing to accept gratitude. You know, I'll give you an example. People like a lot of times I used to, and I used to be bad at this. I used to, when people would say thank you to me, I would just be like, ah, no worries. You know, it's no big deal. That type of thing. No matter what I did, I'd be like, oh, it's no big deal. And what I realized was that was, that was robbing both them and me of right. that happiness because for them, like to them to say, thank you, that means like, you know, that took some effort. And for me to diminish that, that means either it wasn't really that big of a deal right. or I didn't care as much. Right. It wasn't. So, so therefore they might not say it again. And for me, I, I deprived myself of the the value of being great, gra grateful, you know, having somebody be grateful for me. So now when somebody says, thank you, I said, you're welcome. I just let it sit for a minute. You know, My pleasure. so those are the type of things that I think people need to pay a little bit more attention to these days if they want to stay through this insanity that we're all going through. <laughs> Powerful ending, John. Where can people find out more about you? Yeah, actually, uh, check out my new site. Uh, I just relaunched my personal brand um, and you'll find all the different ways to connect with me on social and everything else. But if you go to John uh, jbarrows.com, so the letter J, B as in boy, A-R-R-O-W-S.com, uh, that's where you'll see my background, my why, my values, um, every single, every, every um, connection that you can make. And then there's a bunch of free resources on there as well.